Great. Um, what I'd like to talk about today um, is some stuff we've been doing on uh, I'm trying to implement some of these pulse techniques doing dynamic decoupling. Uh, and in particular, I work on electron spin. So we're doing electron spin resonance. And uh, the honest answer is that coming into this, I was rather skeptical because, and I'll, I'll talk about some of that. Oh, I have five new messages. <laughs> Just what I needed. Okay. <laughs> um, I'll talk about that. It's just the issue of controlling the pulse errors. So, uh, in electron spin resonance, you're putting in pulses, in our case, of 10 gigahertz. We don't have anywhere near the level of control over pulse shapes, pulse amplitudes, and so forth that somebody doing NMR can do. So we can't synthesize our pulses. We have square pulses. We have four channels. We can put in plus X, minus X, plus Y, minus Y. That's it. No, no fancy uh, sculpting of pulses. Um, however, it turns out things work better than I thought. So that's, I guess, why I'm here giving a talk. So. Uh, First, what I'll talk about is some things we did where we were actually controlling some nuclear spins using some tricks, not really tricks, uh, Hyperfine and, and Endor has been around for a long time, but we can do bang-bang decoupling on nuclear spins. And then most of it I'll be talking about uh, using pulses, various dynamical decoupling, uh, and in particular there's some global one over F noise my guess is it's the same thing that Dave Weinland was talking about. We're getting magnetic field fluctuations, which can be a real pain in the neck. And so we've been trying to, uh, to get around those with these pulses. So the basic experiment is a standard spin echo experiment. Uh, if we want to think about it, we're going to do a, a pi over 2 pulse on our spins out here. So we're just going to put it into a superposition of of 0 plus 1, for example. Um, and this just gives us some state. It has two properties. One is that we can see it. It radiates. And so it's good. We, that's what we can detect. And it also is just a non-trivial state. Uh, and so the standard Han echo, you refocus with a pi pulse, of course, and you get your spin echo over here where your 0 plus 1 comes back. What we're going to be doing is taking that pi pulse in general and replacing it with a bunch of things down here. Uh, in some cases, periodic sequences. In some cases, aperiodic sequences. And somewhere at the end, we're going to generate an echo. And we're going to see how big that echo is. And that's going to tell us how much of the coherence that we, we put into the system here do we get back out at the end. Um, there are various ways one can think about comparing these sequences, and we're taking what is maybe the simplest for us, and that is we, we may have sequences of different numbers of pulses, but we'll just fix a time. In fact, what we'll do is in between all these pulses, there are various periods of free evolution, and we're going to take all of those make them all the same, but then change them all together so that we can, in some sense, stretch all this out and as a function of time, as we push that echo over, see how things behave. So let me, let me just say very briefly just uh, about dynamical decoupling. We've, we've heard a lot about it, and I don't have a lot to add other than I'll tell you about the ones that we're going to be playing with or we have played with. So yeah, we're going to replace that single pi pulse with a sequence. Uh, the basic idea, of course, is, as Lorenzo said uh, on Monday, is that you want to refocus the spins rapidly uh, on a time scale short compared to the noise correlation time and in that way preserve your coherence. Um, so you can, if you do bang-bang decoupling there, you need very fast, strong pulses. Uh, if, you, if you're just, for example, in my case, where we have electron spins, and if we just send in microwave spins, you can run into problems that you're just putting too much power into the cavity. Um, 
people have been known to burn up their cavities. Uh, so far, we haven't. However, there's some tricks you can, you can play, and in particular, what we're going to do is work with two different spins, an electron spin and a nuclear spin. And because of the coupling between them, we can put very fast pulses on the nuclear spin uh, without so much power. But then if we're just purely working with the electron spin, there are a bunch of sequences that, that people have worked with. So going back to early days of NMR, there's a Carr Purcell sequence where you do your pi over 2, uh, a square root of x, and then a bunch of x's with, well, first a tau and then two tau. In between every one of those x pulses, you get an echo. Uh, this particular sequence doesn't work very well at all in our system because of pulse errors. What will work better is that if you switch those x's to y's and do so-called CPMG, which is supposed to be there, supposed to be CPMG, uh, where now you still start with your, your pi over 2 about x, but then you do all the other pi rotations about y. Uh, and that is much less sensitive to the pulse errors. Uh, then you have also eight periodic pulse sequences, and I think our, our host, Dan Ladar, has, has been at the forefront of developing some of these. I'm going to talk about some experiments we've done with, with one that he and his group have proposed, where there's an XZ, XZ, that's then concatenated. Uh, in our case, we're going to replace the Z with an XY just for experimental convenience. And also recently, uh, Lou Sham's group has talked about taking this Carr Purcell, Myboom, Gill, CPMG, but instead of being periodic, concatenating it. So just a little bit about the pulses. Normally, when we're doing spin resonance, electron spin resonance, we have a traveling wave tube amplifier that gives us a kilowatt microwave pulse at the end which, as you can guess, had better be pretty short, otherwise something's going to burn up. So you're doing that at maybe 30 nanosecond pulses. However, if you think about it, the pulse length, the power that you need is 1 over the square of the pulse length. So in the end, the energy per pulse that you're going to need in order to get a particular turning angle goes as power to the half. So as you reduce your power, you can reduce your power by a factor of four, but your pulse length only grows by a factor of two. So the overall average power goes down as you make these pulses longer. So what we've done is, in fact, gone to fairly long pulses, quite low power. So this is only a few hundred milliwatts. Uh, so that we can just keep the average power level down in the, in the system when we've been doing this. Um, what we'd really like is something somewhere in between, but. We don't have that option at the moment. So the qubits that we are working with are phosphorus 31 donors in silicon, right? Relatively lightly doped uh, silicon. In fact, uh, most of what I'm going to be showing you is done on one piece that is has a density of phosphorus just a little below 10 to the 15 per cubic centimeter. This is also isotopically purified silicon, so it's silicon 28. So we've gotten rid of, of nearly all the, uh, the nuclear moments. Uh, the energy level structure looks like this. The blue transition, so this isn't the scale. The blue transitions are microwave transitions. One at 9.7 gigahertz, one at 9.8. You have two different transitions because we have a spin one-half electron and a spin one-half nucleus, and the hyperfine interaction in this case is 100 megahertz. So we have the two different microwave transitions, and we have two different RF transitions, 52 and 65 megahertz. And these are all well separated. So we can, we can pick any one of these that we want or any pair and excite them. Um, and that gives us a little bit of leeway in doing some things. So in particular here, I'm just going to talk about this bang-bang control. What we can do is we're going to consider our, our qubit to be the nucleus of, of one of these phosphorus, this phosphorus 31. So this is our qubit, and we can talk about a state 0, state 1, and we can set up some superposition. Then what we can do is do a 2 pi rotation of an electron spin. So we take it. 
when it's the, the, the amplitude in the, in the state one, we can do a two pi rotation on that state, which gives us a phase factor of minus one. And so we can take this A0 plus B1 and turn it into A0 minus B1. Which means we can get a refocusing. We can refocus the nuclear spin with an electron spin transition. And the advantage of that is that if we had to do this with an RF pulse on this, on this nuclear spin, at least in our system, that would be about 10 microseconds. Whereas I said, we can do this electron spin transition in about 30 nanoseconds. So we have what we need for bang bang, which is a very fast refocusing pulse. And just for testing it, what we did was well, let's just drive the nucleus with RF. Let's just uh, do uh, Rabi oscillations on the, on the nucleus. And then we can put in a burst of these microwave pulses, and we can essentially just freeze the nuclear spin wherever we want it. So here we send in one burst of, of microwave pulses on the electron, and it just stays there. And then when we're done, it continues on its way. Or we can come down here, here we send in one burst and then another burst and we just sort of freeze it in a position and then we let it continue on its way. Unfortunately, we always did it at the top or the bottom. We don't have to. We could have put it anywhere we wanted. But for some reason, we put it at the top or the bottom and, uh, and it looks like, but we can in fact freeze it in whatever state you want. So that is an example of bang-bang decoupling uh, where through this hyperfine interaction, we can get very fast operations on the, on the nuclei that would be hard to do in other ways. And I don't know, I think maybe Dave Corey is going to talk some more about using hyperfine in much, much more clever and interesting ways uh, tomorrow. So uh, the rest of this I'll be talking about electron spin qubits. So as I said, we're doped about 10 to the 15 per cubic centimeter. It's isotopically purified uh, phosphorus doped silicon. At say 7 Kelvin, the electron T1 is a couple hundred milliseconds. Uh, and the electron T2, if you extrapolate to something like a single donor, uh, is up around 60 milliseconds in this sample. Uh, this is actually some old data. The, we were first starting to work on this. And what we have here is just uh, T1 and T2. So the blue is, is T1 as a function of temperature. And this is data that, that Fayer had taken in the, in the late 50s. And here is some pulse data that we'd taken on, on T1. And you can see it gets up an hour or something at, at uh, at a one Kelvin, but in fact, in the very first microwave spin echo experiment, Jim Gordon measured T2 of phosphorus donors in silicon. Uh, Jim had just finished as a graduate student building the first maser, and he went off to Bell Labs and made a maser out of phosphorus doped silicon. But interestingly, when he did that, he got a a T2 down here uh, a little below a millisecond. And when we first started working on this, here's some data. These are T2 measurements. We did it at a couple different frequencies, and everything seemed to saturate just about where Jim got it. So we, we came along 50 years later and thought, all right, you know, now we have fancy new machines. Jim had to build his own system. We were going to be able to, to get a long T2. And we ended up saturating just about where he did. I should say this is the point where what it really is. And I can tell you how you get from here to here. And this is this magnetic field noise, we think. Oh, not that quickly. So if you do a measurement, ignore the blue curve for now. If you do the measurement in the usual way, where you pulse multiple times at signal average, you get this black curve. And that's basically what we saw and what Jim Gordon saw. And it comes down, you can see, in, oh, this case, maybe a millisecond or something. However, if you look a little bit more carefully, 
What we do is our, our detector doesn't just measure the microwave power that's emitted in the echo. You see the in-phase and the quadrature part. The part that's in phase with the original driving pulse and the part that's out of phase. And what you see is at first the in phase part, the signal's there. This is, uh, this is actually zero down here. There's hardly any signal in the out of phase. But then on a time scale of something like a millisecond, you start seeing a lot of noise in the in phase and you start getting a lot of signal in the out of phase component. Something is mixing up the phase of the spins and in fact, now we can look at the blue curve. What we did here is if you work very hard, you can get a spin echo signal in a single shot. And then you'd get something that looks exactly like this, but then you take the magnitude of that. So you square these to an atom and you get this signal here. So what's happening is there's some noise, and I'm going to argue that it's magnetic field noise. It's a global noise that's affecting all of our spins in exactly the same way, but it's causing the phase to wander off. Um, and one of the reasons I'm interested in looking at this decoupling is that in order to do this, there are only a few samples that we can get enough signal out of that we can do a single shot echo. Uh, because you take about 100 factor of 100 penalty in signal to noise. So to get around that is a good thing. So we, what we did then was we looked at what kind of magnetic field noise. So the cavity, one, sometimes you want to modulate your magnetic field so it has a coil built in there. So we can measure the voltage coming back out that coil, out of the modulation coils. And if you look at the, the noise you get, uh, you get very nice 1 over F noise. I had originally thought that it was all kinds of noise around the lab. Uh, this is a spur at 60 hertz, but in fact, integrated, that has almost no, no weight under it. Uh, it's all this 1 over F noise. Um, so I, I'm not sure whether it involves background field in the lab. My latest guess is it's domains in the iron. So we have room temperature, iron magnets that supply the field so we can ramp them and get precise fields. Well, anytime you have a, a, a piece of ferromagnet, there are domains and there's this Barkhausen noise as the domains switch around and that's a 1 over F noise and we're guessing that that's what's going on um, and, that, uh, and that this is coming out of the iron of the magnet. We have played some with superconducting magnets and we're getting a new system where uh, this is reduced, but it isn't gone completely. Um, but we'll, uh, we'll know more about that in a few months. So now uh, I'm going to follow Dave Weiland. I'm, we're going to get into the nitty gritty of experiments here. So this, uh, this is a diagram over here of our microwave cavity. The reason I want to do this is because one of the problems we have is we have to worry about pulse errors. And in particular, how homogeneous our magnetic field is, of our, our microwave magnetic field. So the cavity is really, in principle, pretty similar. It's just a metal cylinder. And then there's a hollow cylinder of sapphire inside. This is a, a dielectrically loaded cavity. It has nice properties when you put that sapphire in there. But in particular, if you look, this trace here is the only one you have to look at. That is the vertical magnetic field. That's what's going to drive our spins as a function of the radial distance out here. And you can see it's reasonably constant, but certainly not perfectly constant. So as a function of how far away from the center you are, that field changes. In addition, that field is going to go to zero at the top and bottom of the cavity. And usually you're trying to get as much signal you can, so you put in as long a sample as you can get in there. And so there are going to be inhomogeneous microwave B1 fields in here. And that is one of the big problems we have in doing multiple pulses. So, for example, this car per cell sequence. Remember, there's a CP and also the CPMG. And the only difference is, is for the CPMG, you change all those X's to Y's. Naively, you'd say those sound really a lot alike. But this shows what happens if you keep everything as X's. Here are a series of pulses. So what you can see, these spikes going down here are 
are the microwave pulses. It's a little bit of feed through. The ones marked with a star are spin echoes. So between every pair of microwave pulses, you get a spin echo. You see this thing decays away to almost nothing in, in 15 pulses or something like that. So you can't do a lot of pulses here. On the other hand, now all you do is you switch the phase and you do this CPMG. So you put, instead of X's, put Y's in here. And here it's a little harder to see. Here are four pulses. These are the microwave pulses. Here are the echoes. Here you can see it a little better. I think there are 16 here. You can see the echo is staying pretty much constant. Here's 64. This particular sequence is self-correcting in that it corrects itself for these pulse amplitude errors. So it's critical in these sequences with many, many pulses to have a sequence that corrects for that. Otherwise, uh, yeah, the, they may work on paper, but when you, when you put it into your cavity, this isn't going to work. Uh, I guess I should say another thing. Because of these, these issues, um, it took us a while to get around to being able to do these experiments because, well, in fact, this was about the largest number of pulses we could put in until not so long ago because the manufacturer, the, the system would only put out 64 pulses, and that includes various switches for the amplifier and so forth. Uh, and we went and said, well, we'd like to be able to put out more pulses, and they said, well, nobody's ever wanted more than six. I mean, 64 is 10 times that. What are you worried about? Um, and so finally, we did get a patch to the software. And now we can put out something a little over 1,000. Uh, and we've actually done it. And it worked. And I'll show it in a minute. So, um, so now what I'm going to do is compare some of these sequences. Uh, the CP isn't particularly interesting because that car per cell where everything was X, it all just died away too quickly. Here is a standard CPMG. And you can see this is with one pulse. So this is just a hot echo. Now if you put in four, things get a little longer. 16, it's getting a little longer. And that spectrum there with, with 64, you can see we're getting pretty much a, a good echo. Uh, in fact, um, we're pretty sure that this would actually get from some other data. We haven't tried it with 128 pulses yet, but we're pretty sure it'll get longer. You can see this is an exponential fit with a T2 of 8.5 milliseconds. And you can see it's deviating down here. What that says is I think that at long times, we're still getting this magnetic field noise. We haven't completely decoupled it with, in this case, 64 pulses. It seems to be working in that regard. So um, it's also been proposed that instead of doing a periodic sequence of, these, of this car per cell my boom gill, to do a concatenated sequence. So you start with, with this set of pulses. Well, the pi over 2 is just establishing that uh, superposition to begin with. But now we're going to have a free evolution of pulse two free evolutions, a pulse and another one, and we get our echo over here. And now what we're going to do is each one of the free evolutions we're going to replace with a copy of that to get to the next level of concatenation. And then we do it again and so forth. And it's been argued that this would be, uh, would be preferable. Um, what we're seeing here is we have, at concatenation level here, we have two pulses. Here we have 10. The next level is 42. We're at about 6 milliseconds there. And in fact, what you can do is you can compare the concatenated CPMG and a periodic CPMG. And in fact, the concatenated seems to take a few more pulses to get the same same sort of level of, of protection of your, of your spin. Uh, so uh, at least on this basis, the concatenated doesn't seem to be buying us a lot for the, for the CPMG. So now let me switch over to these 
other, other poll schemes. Again, they're going to be concatenated poll schemes, but instead of just sticking all the others were just X pulses or Y pulses, now we're going to mix it up. So in fact, this XY pair is really a Z pulse, and this XY pair is really a Z pulse. And again, so this is, this is Daniel's uh, concatenated sequence, and uh, what we're going to do is at each level we take the level before and stick it in for these PN minus 1, so they start out as just free evolution and then they get uh, pulses stuck in. Here, just to give you an idea, this is this concatenated at uh, level 2, and this is a CPMG uh, with, I don't know, a bunch of pulses in there. The magnitude of the echo is about the same. And what we found is, it wasn't at least obvious to me starting out, Daniel assured me that this was going to work well, but um, this, this sequence corrects itself. It's like CPMG in the sense that it's self-correcting, and it seems uh, not to be bothered terribly by pulse amplitude errors. And so uh, we can we can put in a lot of pulses and get and get a good uh, a good echo at the end. And in fact, this one we've taken up to even a higher level of concatenation. Uh, so again, here, first level of concatenation is four pulses, then it goes to 14, 60, 242, and this, actually, uh, it's 972, but that's counting the Z's as each, each one being a single pulse. In fact, we're sending an X and a Y. So the total number of microwave pulses is really 1,230 in this particular case. And you can see it's doing quite well. So we're not... We're not losing amplitude from the, the sequence, like for example, the car per cell, you just lose amplitude because of the pulse errors. In this particular sequence, that's not happening. And so, uh, so we're quite happy with that. Um, let's see, then there are a couple sort of sanity checks we wanted to do on some of these. Uh, so in that, uh, in that sequence, the, the, um, the fault-tolerant decoupling sequence, you often end up with pairs of pulses next to one another. And let's say, for example, you'll end up with two Zs next to one another. Well, you can combine those two into, into just an identity. Uh, so what we have done is we've done the same experiment with different numbers of pulses, actually the counting is a little different here because here I'm counting every pulse, the X's and Y's, uh, and not counting the Z's, uh, counting a Z as one pulse, it's now two. Uh, but we can do essentially the same experiment in one case with 510 pulses where we just go ahead and leave every pulse in there even if we have a whole bunch right in a row. And in the other case where we, we combine all those together, Again, in some sense, this is just a test to make sure that we're not fooling ourselves that these multiple pulses are, are, are working all right, and they give essentially identical results. Uh, this is at concatenation level four. So, uh, so that part seems to be working all right. Uh, another thing we wanted to check was the noise that we're dealing with, this this background magnetic field is 1 over f. It has correlations. Uh, however, by simply raising the temperature a little bit, we can introduce uh, another relaxation mechanism, a, a so-called Orbach process. It involves an excitation of the uh, donor electron up to an excited state. And this is essentially white noise. There's the correlation time is, is essentially zero in that process. And so, uh, these sequences, we don't expect them to be able to, to refocus that very well. And in fact, that's pretty much we, what we find. So the red curve here is T1 now, and we've, by going up to this temperature, we push that down to 400 microseconds. Uh, if you just do a hot echo, you still see this magnetic field noise. At the beginning, it's following pretty much right along T1. But then you start seeing large fluctuations, and that's sort of a signature that you're mixing 
the in-phase and out-of-phase channel with this uh, magnetic field noise. But then we used uh, the, this XZ, XZ, in this case, uh, third level of concatenation, and we brought that almost back up to, to T1. So we're not going to go above that because this is white noise, but it's, uh, it's able to, to get rid of this excess noise down here and bring us pretty much back up to the, to the limit. So I don't know, time-wise, am I all right? Yeah, well, we're about all to say. Uh, summarizing then, um, I am a bit surprised to be honest, but the dynamical decoupling uh, works for electron spins. Uh, to be honest, I never expected that we were going to be able to put in a thousand pulses and have any spin echo at the end of that. Um, I had thought that the, that the errors were going to be too large. Partly, uh, the mm, first one of my collaborators on this, Alex A. Tarishkin, is on the, the research staff at Princeton, and he runs the Pulse ESR, and a lot of that has to do with how good he is at making this machine work uh, and at tuning it up. But it will work for electron spins. Uh, I guess the hyperfine, if we can work through the hyperfine interaction and use the, the nuclear spins, then through the electron we can generate very fast bang-bang control of the nucleus. Um, CPMG, of all of the sequences, if we start out with an initial, initial pi over 2 on x, that will... will uh, preserve your, your coherence with the fewest pulses. But I didn't mention though, but that does not deal at all with a pi y over 2. Right? If I had initially, instead of doing it about the x-axis, I do it about the y-axis, the CPMG just turns into a car per cell sequence. Right? You have y, 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 y. It decays away almost immediately. So, CPMG cannot protect against an arbitrary state. And I guess what we found is that concatenated CPMG is essentially the same. It doesn't, concatenating it doesn't really seem to help on that. Um, then we can utilize these concatenated XZ, XZ sequence out to at least a thousand pulses. So it is self-correcting. Um, situation when we start with pi y, I guess I should say I, we don't have all the, the data in on that yet, uh, is a little more complex. Um, it's not clear that the fidelity in, improves monotonically with, with the level of concatenation. However, it is certainly much, much better, orders of magnitude better than CP. Uh, and we're, I guess I should say, it's not that we know it doesn't improve monotonically, we're just, uh, the measurements are all still in progress, we just really don't know. Uh, but if it doesn't, what we may need to do is combine this concatenated sequence, and what we can also do is put in composite pulses. So when you have errors on your pulses, one thing you can do is take up each pulse out of out of several at different angles, and you can you can cancel out a lot of those those errors. So we can replace the X with three pulses and the Ys with three pulses, and uh, with that we may be able to uh, to improve things if if in fact we we do end up with any trouble on on pi Ys. Uh, the initial experiments, I guess I should say, are encouraging, but we're but we're just not not sure yet. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm not aware of that. All right. yeah. And uh, in my opinion, uh, it has to do with the fact that we are also renormalizing the back of the cornea and therefore we are changing the convergence of uh, the method. Um, in regard to the part of the CPMG versus concatenation, um, there is also um, to consider that the, the group over which you are averaging is a reducible one, so it's not true that you get uh, uh, the same improvement that you get otherwise. And lastly, I was just curious. 
I guess what I should say is we've just, it's been fairly recent that we've been able to get this, we had to get this patch to the software on the, on the spectrometer to, to get these things working. So there are a lot of things I think we'd like to try. Um, actually, now that, that things work better than we had, we had sort of imagined that they would, I think there's, there's impetus to, to go ahead and try a lot more of these. You mean what? What is the nature of the error we're getting? Yeah, or like some information about what kind of noises or, or errors are happening there, just because of you know, these sequences perform differently, or you need more pulses for the combinator one. Or, or well, we're we're pretty sure. So in this case, we we've, we've set up a toy problem in some sense, where we're pretty sure we know what the error is. So it's a Z error. It's this fluctuation in the in the magnetic field that's that's giving this. Now, the details as to why the, why sort of concatenated CPMG needs more pulses than periodic CPMG, I'm not sure yet. So we haven't analyzed it at that level yet. Oh, but you could, like, with this model of the error, try to see if you like, replicate Yeah. So there's, a, a, it comes down, uh, I don't know, so what we haven't really looked at with the, with the concatenated CPMG, uh, in any detail is how well that, um, how, 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 if there's any issue with the, with the self-correcting of the, of the, uh, you know, the, the amplitude errors of the pulses. So we know that our, our pulses, that they're all different amplitudes in there. Um, and uh, so I think the simple answer is no, we haven't thought about it. <laughs> Not yet. One more question. If you go back and you look at the difference between, for example, Car Purcell and Car Purcell My Boom Gill, uh, the big difference there, the reason CPMG was introduced, was to get rid of errors associated with pulse amplitudes. So the other errors that we have, right, we're going to have finite pulse lengths, and that shows up here in that I didn't really go into it, but in fact, we're sort of shaving it a little close in that we have a, a rotating magnetic field of about 100 milligauss and a line width of about 50 or 70, all right? And so, in fact, our overall fidelity isn't 100%. It's maybe about 70, 60 or 70% 70 here. Uh, so there's a pulse length there. Uh, phase, we, we can control phase pretty well in, the, in that. So uh, of those, the big error uh, we're quite sure is the, is the amplitude. It's just non-uniform rotating field. Okay. Let's uh, thank Steve again.